Katerina Bussel is a Ukrainian lawyer. She is a senior lecturer at the National University of Kiev Mohal Academy and a fellow at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Katerina has worked on various issues relating to Russia's aggression against Ukraine, with a particular focus on the weaponization of cultural heritage, conflict-related sexual violence, reparations, and Ukraine's transitional justice process. She's worked with the Clooney Foundation for Justice, UN Women, the Global Survivors Fund, and Global Rights Compliance. Katerina has collaborated with Ukrainian NGOs, such as the Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union and Truth Hounds, and has advised Ukrainian prosecutors and judges on war-related proceedings. She was a visiting researcher at the Leibniz Institute for East and Southeast European Studies, a Robert Bosch Stiefung Fellow at Chatham House, and a visiting professor, a professional at the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Katerina, I'm delighted to welcome you to this series of Chatham House interviews. Thank you for having me. And hopefully that, uh, that introduction was correct. I did lift it from the Chatham House website. Um, Thank you very much. Of course, where main focus is going to be on, well, many of these other interviews are focused really on Russian narratives that are designed to stop support for Ukraine and to slow down the military support. We're going to focus on a different topic today, which is the crimes, the numerous and varied crimes being committed by Russia and how these can actually be prosecuted and proven uh, in courts of law. Now, of course, some cases are starting, the majority of cases will be dependent on actually capturing uh, you know, the, the, the perpetrators of these crimes. What do you think is the likelihood uh, of many of these crimes actually going to court and you know, Ukraine being able to get its hands on the Russian perpetrators? Um, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think first we should describe the avenues where these crimes can be prosecuted and then assess the likelihood of capturing um, the alleged uh, suspects. So currently, if we speak about alleged war crimes, crimes against humanity and possibly genocide, uh, the three or four core international crimes, there are three avenues to ensure justice. Uh, first, these are the uh, domestic Ukrainian courts, and it's important to stress that since the beginning of Russia's aggression in 2014, uh, namely since the occupation of Crimea and since the beginning of the direct and proxy war in Donbas, uh, in eastern Ukraine, um, Ukraine has been developing domestic prosecutions of alleged um, enforced disappearances, torture, uh, deportation of the population, of the civilian population, from the occupied territories by Russia and then Russia moving its population to the occupied territories to ensure the demographic change. Um, so uh, Ukraine did react, did start domestic investigations and prosecutions concerning these allegations uh, since the beginning of the war. Uh, then Ukraine also has recognized the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court to try and uh, go after the um, alleged perpetrators of war crimes, crimes against humanity and possibly genocide. And as we know, the court has been conducting a preliminary examination of the situation. And since 2022, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, I will use this abbreviation, has been conducting an investigation, which has resulted in two arrest warrants with respect to Mr. Vladimir Putin uh, and his children's commissioner for uh, the commissioner for children's rights, Maria Lvova Belova. And finally, a very important third avenue is um, the so are the so-called universal jurisdiction proceedings. These are the domestic proceedings in the third countries, which are not connected to the war in Ukraine, for instance. In, Germany and the Netherlands and France, which because exactly of the gravity of alleged crimes perpetrated amid Russia's aggression, can and should uh, act upon them to ensure that there is no impunity for the gravest crimes under international law. So with all these three regimes, there are different requirements about the presence of the suspect. So for instance, Ukraine uh, ideally 
um, uh, should try the alleged suspects when they're apprehended. So when they're in person in Ukraine and in a courtroom, but there is an exception that if a uh, person suspected of the commission of a crime uh, cannot be apprehended, a trial can be held in absentia. Of course, with the strong guarantees that there is uh, the quality of defense representing the accused and uh, that there is a right to appeal. Uh, so there are the in absentia proceedings in Ukraine on the one hand. On the other hand, of course, there are so many Russian prisoners of war, many of whom are either the perpetrators or the witnesses of alleged crimes. And these people can be uh, um, made to participate in the proceedings if there are charges against them or, if again, if they can be used as witnesses. A question which arises often in Ukraine's domestic proceedings is whether if an alleged perpetrator can be exchanged uh, for, for to get some Ukrainian prisoners of war back or civilians unlawfully detained by Russia, whether there is you know, a moral and legal justification to do so. And from what I observe, the majority of the general public in Ukraine, as well as lawyers, say that they want their people back. So uh, they're trying to get as much evidence as possible of such suspects, but then if a prisoner of war exchange will help to get the Ukrainian uh, people back, then they also um, agree to uh, exchange such Russian suspects. With the ICC, with the International Criminal Court, it must be stressed that the court does not um, hold uh, uh, trials in absentia. It means that, for instance, in the case of Vladimir Putin or Maria Lvova Belova, uh, the actual trials can start when these people are apprehended and taken to The Hague. But it does not mean that an investigation cannot proceed while they're not there first. And second, more importantly, that the arrest warrants already have their effect. Because as we know, because of that, Mr. Putin um, has not participated in the BRICS summit. And with respect to the universal jurisdiction proceedings, again, that depends on the legislation of each particular country, whether they allow trials in absentia. But I would stress uh, that... Uh, um, as the Syrian example has shown, for instance, many perpetrators do travel and do register as refugees, for instance, in Germany, and that gave uh, Germany the opportunity to hold many successful trials into the alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity perpetrated by the Assad regime. So hopefully uh, this will we will also see this opening with respect to Ukraine and Russia's perpetrators, many of whom can already be abroad as well. This is an interesting topic uh, about the exchange of prisoners. Now, I can absolutely see um, from the Ukrainian point of view why you'd want to get people back. Um, I think we'll come to that in a minute because another war crime, of course, is the treatment of Ukrainian prisoners. Um, uh, we've seen people come out, especially those from Azov-style siege. Um, they've returned looking very much like um, British servicemen um, who were released or liberated from Japanese um, uh, capture after the Second World War, you know, emaciated, um, some of them perhaps beaten, tortured, not fed properly, malnourished. That in itself, I'm, I'm, uh, it would be interesting, it, it constitutes a war crime. But let's, let's first dig into this idea of the prisoner exchange, because this seems to have been gaining um, greater attention in the last couple of weeks. I even read a, a piece that Ilya Yashin, um, someone who perhaps would not have expected to get involved in this, made some kind of uh, appeal for prisoner exchange. Why is there that pressure now, not just on the Ukrainian side, but also on the Russian side, to do these kind of uh, prisoner exchanges? Um, well, I think exactly because of the reasons which you have mentioned that while international law does require the humane treatment of the prisoners of war, uh, including uh, ensuring that this treatment is provided in a gendered way, meaning that uh, female prisoners of war are kept, are kept and that uh, the care to them is provided by 
uh, the, the female uh, service women by the uh, opposing party, but it doesn't happen in practice. Uh, uh, and of course, we know about the very strong allegations of inhuman treatment and torture. Uh, so there is a natural urge to ensure this ex exchanges and uh, while balancing that, of course, with um, getting the information uh, with those people who are still captured and who are in Ukraine. And um, Ukraine has also enhanced its approach to keeping Russia's POWs because um, it's a very important message for the country both to its own people but also to the international community that despite whatever Russia is doing we are trying to act pursuant to what international law requires meaning that we feed them we don't exploit them for uh, for slavery or something like that. Uh, uh, absolutely the case and what is the interests of Russia I mean could it be this is just pure speculation but could it be that they are desperate to um, have people go back to the front they're finding it tough to conscript people so for them a prisoner exchange means that they get some of their troops back and these are people who they could then put back on the front lines um i think there could be different rationales um i think apart from making people participate further in the war if they're physically and mentally capable to do so uh it's also important for russia to make sure that these people don't speak too much because again they can meet not just the perpetrators that can be uh the witnesses of the command policy for instance of allowing certain atrocity crimes and to not want those people to speak could be one of the ways to uh or one of the reasons to make them go back to russia so a sort of uh effort to to cover up and of course we know that some russian prisoners have, have asked not to be returned um they do not want to go back to the front and and, and risk their lives anymore uh, and some of them will now have seen how they are treated by their officers and the sort of contempt for life um what is the ukrainian policy on returning prisoners and, and what does international law state if a russian prisoner is is adamant that they do not want to be returned to their own country um well um i mean first there should be assess an assessment whether there is a threat of torture and human treatment in terms of the return to their home country and then um in this situation the participation of the third organizations humanitarian organizations could be ensure uh to see to assess also the viability of of the concerns of that prison of war and um one of the one of the risks isn't it uh, that the rate of death the risk of death is so high on the russian side that actually many of those who have committed um crimes uh if even if we go back to the start of the war Irpin, butch and others many of the perpetrators of these crimes will not survive either they'll be killed on the front or as we see in the case of prigozhin and his band of criminals um, you know, they, 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 they'll be dying at the hands of, of, of other Russians. Um, is this a concern uh, to you that, that all this evidence and this, this ability to prosecute, um, that many of these people will, will, will not be alive at the end of this war in order to be, uh, you know, a subject of uh, criminal proceedings? Uh, there are definitely a number of concerns in this regard. First is that um, direct perpetrators will die, but also uh, the fact that these direct perpetrators have more information about their command and the tolerance to uh, perpetrate in the crime or even the endorsement uh, of that. Um, however, it's important that now there are so many ways to document the crime. So, for instance, with Bucha, um, a, a, a very illustrative example would be Russia's claim that uh, it was not involved in the crimes there and that those were the Ukrainian armed forces and that afterwards, I think it was the New York Times investigation that analyzed the satellite imagery, which proved that the bodies and the graves appeared in Bucha before the Ukrainians came there. So, and this is what is called collaborative, av collaborative evidence when it's not just the actual perpetrator or witness uh, who provide the evidence, but of course it's also the victims themselves, but also the satellite imagery and uh, the direct on-site documentation on uh, what other people uh, make. 
uh, there's also so much information and postings by the Russian arm, uh, armed forces themselves, especially during the first phase of the full scale invasion. Uh, so all of this evidence will be analyzed together. Um, another way to address the fact that many perpetrators uh, can be uh, killed in battle or under other circumstances, like with Mr. Prigozhin, is for Ukraine and its international partners to ensure that the justice efforts lie not only in the criminal justice domain, meaning that we speak not only about the courts, but that we speak about the wider truth-telling process and uh, the uh, example, the, the illustrative example would be a truth commission from South Africa, from numerous um, uh, Latin American states, uh, where there will be the initiatives for survivors to come up with their stories, sometimes also the initiative for the perpetrators to come and share their stories. So these informal processes would allow to have more truth and a more nuanced understanding of uh, the dynamics of the warfare and the, 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 the factors which enabled this war in the first place, even if the trials are being very slow or not possible if certain uh, perpetrators were killed. And of course, prosecutions and international law have a very high threshold of evidence-based uh, materials that need to be sort of gathered and collated. And one of the organizations you're uh, involved with, I interviewed them actually very early on um, in the creation of this channel, and that is uh, Roman Avremienka of Truth Hand. Um, and he was was uh, he was actually in the field on on uh, you know gathering information at that point. Um, and we had a, a deeply disturbing but but fascinating conversation. And he was describing some of the methodologies for gathering evidence and already having in mind that you're trying to build a case that needs to stand up. Um, against some very rigorous uh, evidence-based criteria. Um, how effective do you think, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it is in Ukraine, you know, gathering that information and how many different organizations and teams are trained up to that sort of international standard to create uh, prosecutions that will stand up? Well, Russia's war against Ukraine, especially the, the full-scale part, which started um, in 2022, is arguably the most documented armed conflict, uh, for better and for worse, because on the one hand, there are so many means to document uh, atrocity crimes now because of the development of the technology, also because, as you mentioned, such amazing domestic human rights organizations like Truth Hounds have been on the ground since the beginning of the war in Eastern Ukraine and the occupation of Crimea. And they do have the experience of documenting, analyzing the crime, strategizing what um, courts uh, this particular set of information will be useful and how they present the methodology. Um, so the, these factors, uh, they provide the abundance of evidence and the main challenge is to really strategize now. And uh, I think Ukrainian civil society has been trying to do so. So they formed the major human rights NGOs involved in uh, um, conflict-related crimes documentation and analysis formed two um, big coalitions called the Tribunal for Putin Coalition and the 5 AM Coalition, which alluded to the timing of the beginning of the so-called military operation. And they really tried to strategize and streamline their efforts. For instance, there are certain NGOs that specialize on particular crimes. For instance, there's the Crimean Institute for Strategic Research, which uh, the focuses on crimes affecting cultural heritage. There are particular organizations that focus on alleged attacks on um, uh, hospitals and medical facilities. There are particular NGOs that work holistically with uh, victims of sexual violence, and they try to devise um, the, the, the viable methodology for preserving the evidence in very victim-centered and, and sensitive manner, doing no harm, no victimization. And they're also trying to urge Ukraine as a state to provide a more holistic psychological and medical support to these survivors. So these are just a few examples which are which show that the effort to strategize in documentation, uh, both in terms of the topic and in terms of the stakeholder that should receive this evidence is there. But of course, the situation is not ideal because of first, the amount of good willing stakeholders which are trying to do the documentation on the ground. And the fact, of course, that the the, the, the crimes, they don't finish. Like just last um, uh, previous night, we had another set of shelling um, at Kiev, and there is 
the new and new ev evidence emerges. So this strategizing of the documentation as well as trying to prioritize uh, which institution to pass this evidence to, uh, because as we know, Ukrainian Office of the Prosecutor General already has more than 100,000 cases, so that more cases should ideally go to um, foreign prosecutors' offices to start universal jurisdiction proceedings. This is just the challenge for the Ukrainian uh, human rights civil society to tackle. And it's another challenge, the share, not just the scale, and we'll come on to the scale in a minute, but the range of crimes being committed. So, of course, there's crimes against troops, there's crimes against civilians, um, and they fit into a very wide range of, of crimes. As you say, they're committed at some level by um, you know, soldiers, but other levels would be officers, would be more strategic crimes. Is the sheer sort of diversity of these crimes a real challenge in the documentation process? There are two aspects to it. On the one hand, the patterns of the majority of the crimes have been there during the first phase of the war with Crimea and Donbass. For instance, the mistreatment and torture of uh, the prisoners of war, the unlawful detentions of the civilians who are deemed to have a pro-Ukrainian position, the p persecution of those who oppose the occupation, for instance, the Crimean Tatars and ethnic Ukrainian activists in occupied Crimea, rape and other forms of sexual violence. So the patterns have been there. And in a way, both uh, the investigators and prosecutors and the human rights community have had the experience of documenting and analyzing this. What has changed with the full scale invasion is on the one hand, the scale, the territorial scope of the crimes, which means that uh, many more investigators and prosecutors uh, would have to be trained very quickly to deal with these crimes because previously there were just uh, two officers dealing with Crimean and Donbas issues and now essentially the criminal justice specialists across the country would have to deal with the documenting and analyzing um, Russia's crimes. But another challenge which emerged after the full-scale invasion uh, are the new types of crimes which even those criminal justice professionals and human rights lawyers uh, who worked on Crimea and Donbas had not dealt with yet. For instance, numerous instances of sexual violence against children. Uh, the UN Commission of Inquiry has confirmed that the victims of sexual violence after the full-scale invasion range uh, from people who are 4 to 84. So it's, it's a new phenomenon and um, helping these people it, it requires very sensitive, very professional support because they're very deeply traumatized, especially uh, the children. Uh, then uh, the um, shelling and the uh, targeting of Ukraine's critical and energy infrastructure, documenting the shelling, assessing whether it was the shelling which was made um, directly at a civilian object or whether this damage was a result of the use of imprecise weapon is the type of the assessment that Ukraine had has had to do uh, from the scratch um, in, uh, since 2022. And also the allegations of genocide. Uh, lawyers are very overcautious about using this word. It's the crime that requires under international law a very high threshold of proof to prove a special intent to destroy one of the four groups in, in the um, case of Ukraine, a national group in whole or in part. And the the, the legal discussions about uh, the possible evidence of a genocidal intent have emerged with a full scale invasion. And it requires a very cautious legal approach with, with, with a thorough also analysis of historical background of Russia's imperial nature and a neo-colonial subjugative attitude to Ukraine to prove this. And also the final novel thing uh, that we are trying to develop both internationally and domestically are the charges against Russia's propaganda figures. Uh, it's uh, apparent that uh, their hate speech at certain points has um, reached the uh, threshold of uh, the propaganda of war and possibly at the incitement to genocide. And again, it's a totally new character of the case that Ukrainian domestic investigators and prosecutors and human rights lawyers have um, want and have to, to deal with starting with a full-scale invasion. So I would say that both the ge geographical scope and the novel nature of certain crimes are the uh, major challenges that uh, people who respond to the armed conflict have been facing since the full-scale invasion. Well, you've anticipated my next three questions, which is fantastic. Um, 
But the one I really want to dig into actually was the, the genocide and the propagandist one, because journalists, historians, I've been at many events where they've been extremely reticent to use that word. Um, and this was after, you know, Butcher Pin, some of these acts came to light after the destruction of Kohovka even. Um, and I've been in the room where journalists and, and, and historians have disagreed with each other. Some absolutely prepared to, to use the genocide word. Others still, you know, quite uh, reticent about using it. But as you say, you know, if you watch any significant amount of Russian propaganda, and unless you absolutely have to, I don't recommend anyone does that because it's fairly nasty stuff. But if you can listen to it in the original, as, as, as I can, and if you listen to many, many hours of it a week, you realize that genocidal comments, incitements to genocide are not a one-off. They're not a bug, but they are actually a feature of these broadcasts. Several times a week, you can hear several figures saying things that are clearly uh, genocidal in their, in their intent. And these people who utter these statements are not taken off the air, but they're either regular presenters or they're commentators that are brought back again and again. The one that, that um, shocked me, I could say didn't really shock me because nothing shocks me anymore uh, when watching Russian TV, was a priest, a priest, um, a senior uh, Orthodox uh, priest uh, in, the, in the Russian Orthodox Church under the Moscow Patriarch. And he literally said that uh, Ukrainians are not Christian, that actually they have a pagan form of religion, and the only cure to it is either to convert, and if they don't agree to convert, then um, he, he basically called for liquidation of anyone who, who, wouldn't, uh, who wouldn't change their belief. Um, these comments happen over and over and they form a pattern. Why is it so difficult in international law to, to, uh, to, to, to really sort of put that label on it? And how can these propagandists be brought to trial? And that would include, in my mind, uh, Orthodox priests as well, who again seem to be treated as a separate class of propagandist, whereas I don't think they should be. I think they should all be looked at. Uh, for the sort of quality of their statements? Um, there are several factors to consider. Um, on the one hand, as I mentioned, uh, from a formal legal perspective, uh, there is a very high threshold to prove genocide and lawyers are notoriously overcautious about doing this because they're very concerned with what they would call the political or journalistic kind of use of the term. And they would always try to say that the legal qualification is different. I agree with this, that the legal qualification is a different and very narrow. But the problem is that the majority of international lawyers, as you have no noted, do not speak Russian. So, and they don't necessarily have the subtle knowledge of the history of the region, of the Soviet Union, and of Russia's imperial policies. And it takes them time, essentially, to do this reading. That is why, on the one hand, we have the professionals like Timothy Snyder, or my colleagues from Chatham House, with the profound multifaceted understanding of, of uh, the region and uh, the dynamics between historical dynamics between Russia's and Ukraine's um, uh, history and relations. And with lawyers, it just takes longer to familiarize with that first. And of course, uh, the same happens with the statements. Um, they, they're not translated as actively and as holistically. Certain um, uh, uh, law platforms um, have tried to start compiling the translation translations of the hateful statements of Russia's uh, top officials or propaganda figures. So, for instance, the international law blog Just Security has the compilation of a genocidal rhetoric and uh, in English. And of course, if you read it, you see that there is the viable case to at least speak about hate speech, which at a certain point uh, viably uh, reaches the threshold of direct and public incitement to genocide. Also, what I would say, apart from these 
major um, uh, hateful rhetoric coming from the propaganda figures like Solovyov, Simonyan, or Krasovsky, we should also speak about uh, the propaganda um, uh, messages and the denial of Ukraine's uh, statehood, as you said, in the speeches of the leaders of the church, as well as that of the politicians. And I speak about the essays and the speeches of Mr. Putin, uh, Mr. Medvedev. Uh, also, the, the role of the state media, for instance, the notorious article, What Russia Should Do with Ukraine by Timofey Sergeyev, was published on the uh, state-owned outlet Ria Novosti, which essentially is like the endorsement by the state of those very precise and explicit exterminationist uh, messages provided in that article. So what I would just say that there should be, with the on the one hand, the outrage, which I know many Ukrainians and people, uh, the foreign scholars uh, on the region feel that it takes so long to understand how grave the situation is. I would say that just translating the messages and trying to explain in English the methodology of reading these messages and connecting them is very important. And also to look at uh, the rhetoric, which perhaps comes not from the top officials or the top military commanders in Russia, but the rhetoric that accompanies uh, the commission of the crimes on the ground. I will provide one example. Uh, there is a report on gender-based violence in eastern Ukraine during the first phase of the war. Uh, and there, there, there is a witness, um, the report was compiled by um, an NGO called uh, Eastern Ukrainian Center for Civic Initiatives. And it provides the victim statement of a woman who was detained uh, by uh, the Russian armed groups in Donbass and who said that uh, she was pregnant at the moment and she told them that she was in this special state and that she hoped that that would pervade any sort of mistreatment and that they very expressly said that there would be no problem that if an Ukropka, and I think she was also a Jewish woman and her husband was a, an ethnic Ukrainian, that their child uh, would not be born. So this hateful rhetoric has been accompanying Russia's atrocity crimes since the beginning of the war. And what's also important is not just to translate them, but again, to connect the uh, the hateful rhetoric of the perpetrators on the ground with the messages of the top propaganda figures, state leaders and church leaders, and see that there is unfortunately a very strong connection. And how difficult, I mean, if, if, if we look at the, the larger strategic crimes and of course, uh, you know, the shelling of clinics, cultural institutions and so on, there may be many forms of evidence, including satellite evidence and so on. But when it comes to individual crimes, um, including sort of uh, sexual violence against individuals, there may not be any other witnesses to those crimes. How difficult is it going to be to prosecute um, where evidence may be very difficult to gather? There may not be witnesses and it may not be clear exactly who the perpetrators are. You know, you may be able to trace it to a particular regiment or a particular battalion within the Russian army. But what, what are the real challenges here? in bringing justice to these individuals? Well, sexual violence cases are notoriously underreported and under-prosecuted in all conflict situations, and Ukraine is not an exception, and uh, there are a, a multitude of uh, reasons for it. The stigma about this particular type of violence, uh, the stigma comes both from women and men. It's just very gendered, very dif different, but it's there. Uh, also, the fact that many of these victims, they really need strong psychological and medical support be before they are uh, willing and able to participate in criminal proceedings. And it's just important not to pressure them. What's important is to show that the state and the civil society are there to provide this primary foundational support, which again should be about fe the feeling of security and the support of uh, um, the proper mental and physical well-being. And in terms of the documentation, um, it's interesting that because of the scale of Russia's crimes, and again, because we have seen the patterns of this behavior between 2014 and 2021, uh, th there are many um, guidelines. So for instance, the UN Commission of Inquiry uh, in its uh, report from March this year, 
has mentioned that there is a very strong evidence already that sexual violence has been perpetrated into contexts during the house to highs ra rates um, during occupation, as well as in the context of detention. And as we know, not only from Ukrainian investigators and prosecutors, but also from human rights NGOs, from the organizations like Truth Hounds, which you mentioned yourself, as well as from international human rights NGOs like Human Rights Watch, for instance, Russia has does seem to have a policy and the infrastructure of the so-called torture chambers. And when the troops retreat, uh, the um, tools of torture are oftentimes found in these torture chambers. So, for instance, the use of electric cords to, for electrocuting genitalia are oftentimes found in these torture chambers. And this evidence corroborates, of course, the uh, uh, statements of victims and witnesses. And, uh, well, perhaps not surprisingly now, again, the weaponization of sexualized torture in such torture chambers is pretty well established. And the UN Commission of Inquiry says that Russia even has the names for this type of sexualized torture. It's called uh, a call to Putin or a call to Lenin when they connect these courts uh, to a person's genitalia. And again, it applies both both to women and men. So on the one hand, I do agree with you that it's hard to prosecute sexual violence, that it under investigated and under prosecuted, but exactly because of the scale and gra gravity of Russia's uh, um, weaponization of uh, sexual violence, it's increasingly, um, there are increasingly more dots to connect and actual evidence on the ground to build these cases. And currently, the Office of the Prosecutor General has a specialized division on conflict-related sexual violence in its war crimes unit, and they have more than 200 cases already underway. Um, this is uh, definitely not indicative of the whole spectrum uh, of the crimes or uh, of, of all the people who were uh, victims, but it's already a good beginning. And the burden on Ukraine is huge. I mean, not only are you dealing with a big part of the population who are overseas uh, in refugee status. You're dealing with all the other issues of trying to keep the economy going and so on. So how can third party countries help Ukraine in ensuring justice for the survivors of these, you know, un unimaginable uh, scale and viciousness of, uh, you know, Russian atrocities? Well, in the criminal justice domain, this avenue of universal jurisdiction proceedings, which I mentioned, um, it, it will be very useful, meaning that third countries uh, react and open investigations and prosecutions into war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocides allegedly perpetrated in Ukraine. Um, also because they oftentimes have victims and perpetrators on their soil as refugees. So this avenue is important. Um, second and foundationally, there should be more support um, mental health support and medical health support for victims and witnesses, but also to the criminal justice professionals. It's not been talked enough uh, much at all uh, that it takes a lot of um, effort and it takes a lot of um, emotional health for investigators and prosecutors to constantly deal with the evidence of torture and sexual violence. And uh, it's also part, I would say, of this mobilization and perhaps in a way of you know, masculine attitude that we're strong enough to deal with it and that all help should go to those who suffered, who were victimized directly. But it's just not sustainable. Uh, so more mental health support should be there for the criminal justice professionals who work on these cases. With respect to survivors, um, we have done a couple of studies. For instance, the Global Survivors Fund uh, has done a study on the needs and preferences for reparations from victims of sexual violence in Ukraine. And uh, these people have stated that while um, Having criminal prosecutions is very important for them. It's really important for them to see the naming and shaming of Russia's perpetrators. And again, this is where the third country's prosecutions are also so important. They're also saying that, of course, the foundational medical health support and psychological support, couple counseling are very needed. And this requires enormous financial resource or sometimes the treatment abroad. So this is where the help would be um, very important. And also many of these people naturally first had to move from Donbass because of their security concerns. And now many of their hundreds, sometimes uh, houses, 
to which they relocated from Eastern Ukraine or Crimea, were damaged or destroyed by uh, Russia's full-scale invasion. So, of course, the support with housing is also one of the needs for them. And uh, any training programs which, which give the survivors an opportunity to rebuild their life and make sure that they can earn uh, for their lives themselves is something that they're also asking for. So any prog programs like that supported by foreign partners would be very welcome. And you used the term, I think, earlier, transitional justice, which uh, uh, I see uh, you know, mentioned quite a lot. Um, what uh, relevance does that term have to Ukraine? And how could the concept of transitional justice uh, be used to help these survivors? of Russian atrocities? Well, transitional justice is a range of both judicial and non-judicial measures. And by non-judicial measures, I mean truth-telling initiatives, memorialization, reparations, and institutional reforms. So essentially, uh, and of course, criminal prosecutions, which are the judicial measures. So it's a very holistic set of measures which are aimed to provide a holistic support to victims on the one hand, but also transform the state uh, and the society in a way to make them more resilient and sustainable and to, to prevent any further aggression. Of course, we understand that the guarantees for this transition should be both external from Ukraine's international partners and transformed Russia, but also they should be internal. You know, the way the social support and medical support is ensured uh, sustainably for victims of atrocity crimes, the way their employment is made possible, the way the cr criminal prosecutions are uh, being made effective. And also, of course, when we speak about institutional reforms, which is a big uh, component of transitional justice, it's also about Ukraine living up to the expectation of its own people, meaning finalizing the anti anti-corruption reform, finalizing the reform of the judiciary, making uh, the uh, um, uh, assets of the state officials also public and them being held accountable. So it's a wide set of transformation of measures which go beyond the mere trials, but aim to provide the targeted support to victim and witnesses and also the wider transformation of the state. And in previous conversations I've had, especially those who are involved in the transformation of the uh, the justice system. Many have said that um, whereas institutions like journalism and others um, were being transformed very early on, uh, you know, after Maidan especially, and one of the factors of transforming, say, uh, you know, the practice and teaching of journalism is that they were able to clear out, you know, perhaps the older generations all in one go, those who are trained under the, the Soviet system and a new wave of young professionals were able to, to, to bring changes quite rapidly to that sphere. Um, that's more of a challenge, isn't it, in the field of justice where it takes many, many years to rise up from the sort of junior positions right up to the role of senior judges uh, in, in, say, high courts and so on. So how are those you know, transitions going? within the justice system and are there still a lot more changes required in order to completely move beyond um I would say the old sort of soviet justice system and, and and some of the issues that you mentioned there like sort of corruption nepotism or even just maybe old-fashioned uh, values um uh, having a having a, a bearing on on some cases well, uh, the zero tolerance to corruption and the effective punishment for it uh, should be ensured system-wide, not only within the judiciary. But I agree with you that um, the sacking of the professionals in the judiciary will not help. First, because uh, that would uh, incapacitate the, the proper consideration of the cases. And second, because now Ukraine is already lacking the criminal justice professionals. So it's really about the transformation. And I think I see some positive uh, developments here. Um, first, uh, the, the professionals from the criminal justice system are now, after the full-scale invasion, very well aware that the international community, uh, the, the, the foreign fellow lawyers, are looking very carefully at the way they're considering conflict-related cases. Uh, and because of that, they have really opened up to external consultancy. So they really cooperate very closely with the human rights um, 
Ukrainian uh, community. They really work closely with academics and foreign lawyers. Um, currently, the Office of the Prosecutor General also has a separate set of advisors of the leading international lawyers who have practiced um, at international uh, courts across the world and who are trying to bring their expertise and combine it with that of the young Ukrainian lawyers who also know the Ukrainian context and then together by joining this domestic and international effort, they advise the investigators and prosecutors and judges in the proper consideration of conflict related cases. So it's not as easy and it's not that idealistic, but what I'm trying to stress is that this openness of the very rigid and close um, criminal justice sector to external consultants and to engagement both with its uh, own uh, Ukrainian young professionals and foreign consultants is already a, a shift of um, a change. Uh, now, of course, we will just uh, uh, ensure, have to ensure in Ukraine that this shift is uh, uh, system-wide at all levels. By, by what I mean, that it's not just Kyiv and the central offices, the war crimes unit of the Office of the Prosecutor General, but that the course of the first instance across the country and the investigators across the country uh, have the opportunity to cons to engage with the human rights lawyers and the civil society and that they really enhance their quality, the quality of their proceedings through that. And the very last question really is, you know, justice is obviously incredibly important, but also reparations can be important in part of that healing process. And of course, helping individuals uh, move beyond the terrible experiences and losses um, than we have gone through. So what reparations, if any, are available or planned for the survivors of uh, Russian crimes? Uh, well, first, um, in the Ukrainian context, and I would say that it's a wider post-Soviet context, reparations would often be understood as interstate payments after the end of the war. Very few people um, here in Ukraine are understood that under international human rights law, reparations is also the support to individual victims of the gravest atrocity crimes. And this lack of awareness, of course, also has had an impact uh, uh, on the development of respective policies. Um, however, the progress has been there. So, for instance, even before the full-scale invasion, Ukraine had a scheme for uh, victims of torture who have been detained and tortured because of their pro-Ukrainian position. And these people, after the consideration of their case by a group that uh, had uh, in it not only the representative of the state, but also the representatives of the leading human rights NGOs who help victims of torture and who verify that the person really was captured for her or his support for Ukraine, they had a chance to receive 100,000 hryvnias, which at the time was around 3,000 euros. Now, that this is nothing in terms of the need for the medical healing and buying the new housing um, after the captivity, but at least the initiative and the understanding where had been there before the full-scale invasion. Now, with the full-scale invasion and the fact that so many people became aware both of the hardship and that the state understood that the more holistic support to victims is needed, a couple of other shifts have been there. So there are currently several draft laws underway to ensure that Ukraine has the electronic registry of victims. So essentially that people can submit their cases and describe the type of damage that they have um, suffered from Russia. And that on the basis of that, their needs will be assessed and the support will be provided. Uh, it's uh, very long. It's not easy because it's very financially burdensome, to say to say the least. So Ukraine is still considering the system of the so-called urgent interim reparations, which could be small payment while the wider system of reparation is being approved. But most importantly, that at least the basic support, for instance, the certificates for certain medical screenings at least are provided to a wider spectrum of uh, witnesses. A couple of draft laws are considered and hopefully they will be soon registered uh, with the parliament and considered by the parliament. And Ukraine has also approved the system of uh, registering the damage to the property and applying for the compensation in that regard. But again, we should see how effective this system is. Well, Katalin, it's been a, a huge pleasure. I think this is an incredibly important topic and clearly the work you're doing is, is absolutely fundamental to Ukraine's future and moving on from this uh, horrific period. Um, 
obviously everyone watching this channel is confident of Ukrainian victory, but I think victory will not be achieved until reparations and this healing process uh, have really got underway. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you for your time in talking us, uh, talking to us this morning. And um, yes, I hope to to be able to speak to you again to understand how this process is moving forward and how the prosecutions are developing. Thank you very much for having me.